God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Keith has asked to do the prayer for the preacher today, so he's going to come forward now and say a prayer. Good morning. Dear Pastor Terry, perhaps you cannot find God's hand or see his face through some hour of despair. Do not be grieved. Go seek the good, clean land, and you will find him there. He is part of every wind, wind that sweeps across the furrows down their upturned length. Breathe deeply of it. Here is where God keeps stored healing and stored strength. Wander a while down some still wooded way. Stoop to the lichen. Dig through the mossy sod. Stir in the leaf mold and the feathery spray of a fern can show you God. You can touch him as you touch the bark of a tree. You can hear his voice in the voice of the singing birds. Dear God, may Pastor Terry listen. God, may she look and see thy face and hear thy words. Amen. Thank you. Some of you probably think I'm crazy for even coming today. I am, but you know, this is my family too. So thank you all for everything you've done for me, for my mom, and just thank you. This is one of my favorite passages of scripture that we read today, both the lesson, the Lucan account in his gospel, and also he wrote the letter to the, well it's not a letter, Acts of the Apostles. Some people refer to it as the gospel of the Holy Spirit. And Theophilus is the person he wrote both the Gospel of Luke and the um, Acts of the Apostles are addressed to Theophilus, which basically just means God lover. That's why I'm sorry Theo is not here today. Well, Theodore means lover of God. But um, Jesus is there with the disciples, and he's suddenly taken out of their sight, and they just stare up at him. And these two angels appear and they say basically this is a paraphrase but what's up what's up so what's up church that's that's the question i want you to answer today what's up what's up in the world what's going on in the world today you know what's going on in the world you live in the world what's going on in the world today uncertainty, uncertainty. amen and if you're not aware, there's going to be a presidential election next year, in case you haven't been inundated with a 1,012 different political campaign commercials already. I'm thinking, wow, what's it going to be like this time next year? It's going to be really crazy. What else is going on in the world? What's up, church? What's up in the world? Plants are being planted. Plants are being planted. Amen. That's not all negative, is it? What's up in the world? We're coming out of a pandemic, finally. Thank you, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen? What's up, church? What's up in the world? The war in Ukraine. What else is up in the world, church? The war in Sudan. What's up in the world, church? Climate change. Argument over climate change, argument over this, that, and the other, right? There's a lot going on in the world. So I think the question is, instead of what's up, is who's up? You know I like baseball, right? Who's up? We've been on the on-deck circle for a while now. It's time to get up at bat, right? Who's up? Whose turn is it to take a swing at this crazy world? Not with a bat like you're beating it to death, but whose turn is it to do that walk-off home run? Ours, amen, amen, amen. We are called to be the presence and power of God in the world. Jesus left his apostles and they're staring at the sky going, where are you at now, Lord? Why do we, what do we do without you? What did he say to them? You're gonna be clothed with power from on high. 
Next week we're going to celebrate Pentecost. I hope you're all wearing red. Anybody going to wear red next week? Some of you will wear red for Memorial Day. You'll wear red, white, and blue, and you'll get here and say, oh, look, I got red on. It's Pentecost. <laughs> wear red because people will say to you, what's all this red about? And you'll have a chance to say, this is about the power of the Holy Spirit coming upon the church. Does it mean that we don't have any power until next Sunday? No. Does it mean that we won't have any power after next Sunday? No. What it means is that we will have power from on high again and again and again. I love the Greek tenses. There's one called the aorist participle that talks about things that happen once and go on forever. The birth of Christ is one of those. The resurrection of Christ is one of those. Pentecost needs to be that for us. It reminds us that, yes, we have been empowered by the Holy Spirit to be Christ's presence in the world. But look at where we're supposed to go. Where did he send them? First to Judea, then to Samaria, then to the ends of the earth. We are the ends of the earth. You know that, right? From Jerusalem, we are the ends of the earth. But first of all, what's our Judea? Where's our Judea? Does this mean you have to get on a plane and fly to Israel? No. He says, start where you are, where you live. There are people in this community that do not know they have a Savior who loves them, who gave his life for them. We're supposed to bring them into the church, right? Right? right. Yes. But how do we bring them into the church? By taking the church out of these walls. Because Jesus was not up in the sky. He was not locked there. He's not in heaven as opposed to being with us because he said, I will be with you always until the end of the age. I will be with you through the power of the Spirit living in us, acting through us, loving through us, to others in the world. Our Judea is Cockeysville or Timonium or Parkton or Parkville or wherever you live, that's your Judea. That's where you're supposed to start. What's Samaria? What was the problem with Samaria? filled with Samaritans. They didn't like Samaritans, did they, the Jews? Because the Samaritans were the ones left behind during the exiles. They were the ones who sort of continued. They built their own temple in Gerizim, on Mount Gerizim, not in Jerusalem. And they fought with the Jews over that the rest of their lives. My temple's better than your temple. God lives in my temple, not in your temple. But is God in the temple? Yeah, God's in the temple, but God is bigger than any temple. Jesus is bigger than this building or any building with a steeple on it. Jesus is in the world and wants to be in the world. We've got to take him out of this building and take him into the streets of Cockeysville and then to Samaria. I can't tell you where your Samaria is. You know, though. Is there anybody who just plucks your last nerve in your life? You say, no, I'm going to tell you're lying because you know there's somebody who works your nerves, right? Nobody's going to admit to that, huh? What about the people you just don't like because of what they've done? Maybe it's not an ethnic group, but maybe for some of you it could be an ethnic group. It could be people who don't look like you, or people who live in the dreaded city of Baltimore, or squeegee kids, or somebody like that. Maybe you don't like people who molest children because nobody likes their actions. God loves their hearts. God wants them back. Maybe it's people who sell drugs or distribute drugs or get people hooked on drugs. Maybe those are the people that you just don't like. Maybe they're your Samaritans. Maybe that's your Samaria. But we're called to go there with the good news of Jesus Christ that's going to redeem and restore the world to the way it should be in Christ's name, to build the kingdom. Not to build it, but to embody it, because only Christ can build the kingdom. But he started it when he came, and he will finish it when he comes back. He will come back one day, but until then, he is with us in the power of his spirit, as long as we let that spirit out then to the ends of the earth. Maybe the ends of the earth for you are parked in Maryland. Maybe it's where First Fruits Farm is. They advertised today on Facebook. They said, we're starting up our, I forget what season it is, what number season it is, of feeding the hungry in the name of Jesus Christ. That's what they're about. Now, I don't know what seeds you've planted. Anybody plant anything good this year? Toby, I know you've planted. What have you planted, Toby? Cucumbers and green peppers. Anybody plant zucchini? How many zucchini are you going to get? Like boatloads of zucchini? Sometimes you do, sometimes you don't. I have had people who, a woman went to the store to get beet seeds for her husband. She got a pound of beet seeds. He's, a pound of beet seeds. He said, 
what are we going to do? Have like 40 acres of beets? They had so many beets that year. I mean, he was giving beet seeds to everybody he knew. Some people will plant a couple of zucchini seeds and they'll have more zucchinis than you could bake bread to, out of it. You don't know how your seeds are going to turn out, do you? But you know they will grow if you nurture and tend them. We've got to plant seeds of hope in this community. We've got to plant seeds of faith in this community. We've got to plant seeds of forgiveness and grace and power from on high. Because we have been given that power. Next week we're going to remember the power coming upon us. But it is here now. So who's up? Who's up to the task? Who's up on the deck? Who's up at the plate? Ready to swing the bat at the world? Not beating the world, but to hit that home run, to make Christ known to the world. That's what we're called to do. So we can either stand with our head in the clouds looking up, which is fun to do in an elevator if you've never done it. Anybody ever do that? I had to do it in college for a psychology class. I almost ended up being arrested and committed myself. But you know, you stand there and look up, people are going to be, they're going to try not to be obvious, but they're going to be looking up to see what it is. What if we did that with the way we live? What if we live in such a way that invites other people to share our faith, to know Christ? What would it look like next Sunday if you invited somebody that you just don't like to church? Well, I have somebody you don't like, right? I know you do, because you're human. Maybe you have somebody who just you just don't like. Oh, please, come on. We all have people like that, right? What would it be like if you invited that person to worship with you in this congregation? You know what it's going to do? It's going to break down a barrier between the two of you. Maybe if you go to somebody and say, you know, I know you're upset with me over something that happened 15, 25 years ago, but I want you to come with me to church next Sunday. They're at least going to think about it really hard. And if only one person comes, maybe that person will get on fire with Christ and go into the world and share Christ's love. So maybe next Sunday when you're wearing your red, you'll invite somebody to come sit with you in the congregation to understand that Christ is present with us. But don't keep him in this building. Let him free. Let him free from your mouth, from your heart, from all the places where he has been so long. And let him out. Let him work in the world through your love, through your ability to forgive others, through your grace your gratitude, your generosity, until he comes again as he has promised, because he will. But until then, he is with us, he is in us, and let him live through us. Amen, amen, amen.